All right, everybody, let's get the lecture going uh, for today. Good to see everybody here. Um, so as I'm sure you can see, so the um, subjects that we're going to be focusing on today are stress and strain. Now, has anybody done stress and strain before? Who's done stress and strain before? Anybody? Oh, OK, so just a few people. OK, so that's great. If this is going to be uh, some new concepts for you, if you have done this before, Maybe we'll have some uh, new angles on it. And also you can help out the people around you. Now, stress and strain, they have something a bit in common with a topic from a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at work and energy. Because stress and strain, they're one of these words that we use in everyday language. You know, maybe you're really feeling a strain, maybe you're really feeling stressed. But of course, in physics, they have some specific meanings. So we're going to be finding out what those specific meanings are today and uh, having a look at some examples. But with the case of stress and strain, it's quite interesting because there's actually some connections between how we use these words in everyday language and what they actually mean when we're talking about them in physics. So I thought it might be a bit interesting to just make that connection there a bit. Um, I think it might actually even help us to understand the concepts um, as uh, physics concepts. So I'd like to start with a quick question to get everything going. So I know this point in the semester, you know, we've just had the coursework for physics. Uh, do you have coursework for your other modules? Any other modules have coursework yet? OK, OK, so you start to get more coursework and we're starting to think about the exam. People are asking about the exam. So maybe at this point in the semester, you're starting to feel a bit under, a bit, under, bit of a stress. So I thought, let's start with a quick question. Let's do a quick poll. Let's see how everybody is doing at this point in the semester. OK. So I'll just emphasize there's no wrong answers with this one. OK, so uh, they're all fine. Um, if you do want to ask someone else for a bit of help with this one, you're more than welcome if you're not sure exactly how stressed you're feeling as well. OK, very good. Good to see all those responses coming in. I'm curious. I'm really curious to see um, how everybody is doing at this point in the semester. Let's take a look. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, OK, OK. So most people are going for B, the kind of slightly stressed, some people moderately stressed, a um, few people very stressed, few people not stressed at all. Now, this is actually a very interesting distribution where we have kind of most of the people in the middle there, a couple of people outside. Uh, is anybody who's not feeling stressed at all this point in the semester? OK, OK, a couple of people. OK, well, I'm glad if you're not feeling um, stressed at all. Um, what I would say, I've got a few more points if you are feeling very stressed or especially if you've been feeling stressed for too long. Um, there are actually a kind of couple of serious points that I'd like to make about this, both in terms of the connection in terms of stress as a physical concept, but also when we're thinking about um, learning things in physics, um, being at university, it's actually important to think a little bit about um, how we are managing stress especially at this point in the semester, you know, a lot of that excitement of the first couple of weeks, maybe that's uh, not going quite so much. And, you know, maybe the pressure is building a bit. So I just got a couple of slides uh, thinking a little bit about stress in the kind of the non-physics uh, sense of it. Now, I thought it was interesting that the results, they, they follow this kind of um, normal distribution almost with most people in the middle and uh, some people on the outsides. And there's actually quite an interesting relation in terms of how much stress people are feeling and how they're performing. So let's take a look at that on this slide over here. So what I have on this axis, I'll, I'll move the code out of the way so you can, you can all see what that is there. Let me just get this code out of the way. So what we have over here on the horizontal axis, this is stress, but not physical stress. This is, you know, what we might think of as, you know, personal stress. And on this axis, we have performance. So maybe how well you're doing, you know, in the workshops every week or how well you're doing in your coursework, how well you're going to be doing in the exams. And there's actually quite an interesting relationship between how much stress people are under and their performance. Has anybody seen anything like this before? 
Or is this a kind of, kind of new angle? So I do think it's important to um, bear this in mind a bit when we're thinking about working a bit harder. We're going to be picking up the pace in lectures. So it kind of looks something like this. If you're really not under any stress at all, quite often there's not so much performance. And as the stress builds, your performance increases until you get to a certain point. And then once you get to a certain point and you're kind of too stressed, there's too much stuff going on, then your performance kind of falls off a cliff. And we really don't want anybody to be getting into that situation. Okay, so I hope uh, we don't have people uh, too far over there. But this is actually quite important for us to think about when we're approaching how we are learning physics. Do you guys remember, was it a couple of weeks ago, we thought a bit about that, you know, the system one and the system two. Do you, do you guys remember that? Yeah, so the, the system one, that's the kind of the easy, intuitive thing. The system two is the hard work. So if you are learning anything new like physics, it is going to be kind of a bit hard work. You may be, you're going to have to be feeling a bit exercised. But if we're all the way over here and you're really not feeling any stress at all, um, what you can happen is that you can end up kind of being a bit kind of bored and unmotivated. And that's especially something that we really want to avoid in this year, your first year studying at university. Because, you know, some people, they have done some of these concepts before. So what I would say is if you are feeling kind of over here, maybe a bit too relaxed, maybe you're feeling a bit bored, make sure you are trying all of the challenge questions in the workshops every week. Because even though they're more difficult than we're going to be focusing on, uh, you know, that we're going to see in the exam or something like that, Whichever degree you're doing, you are going to be seeing questions like that, be seeing more difficult questions as you make uh, progress through your degree. So it is certainly going to be something that's going to be directly useful for you. So meanwhile, if we go over here, if we're kind of increasing the stress a bit more, so I guess this is where quite a few people were. This is actually the kind of optimum kind of training zone. So this is actually kind of where we really like people to be, maybe not all the time, you know, make sure you're kind of relaxing. Uh, taking a bit of time to recharge. But whenever you're wanting to learn anything new, whenever you're wanting to develop yourself, you do have to kind of get into this sort of optimum sort of training zone. Now, the important point I'd like to make about this is very often when people start university, um, some people can find, ah, hey, this is kind of difficult, maybe a bit more stressful, especially if they've had an easier time with their studies at school. So the thing I'd like to point out here is if you are finding the course, you know, a little bit stressful, you're finding there is a bit of pressure, please don't worry about that. That doesn't mean anything is going wrong. That often just means that you're making progress. You don't want to be here all the time. Make sure you are getting back and relaxing. But if you are feeling a little bit of stress, quite often that can be just the kind of um, situation you need to be making progress. So then, of course, once we get over here, you know, the stress is kind of really building if anybody's feeling like this, it's not a lot of fun. And you certainly don't want to be excessively strained for too long. Again, it's a bit like, does anybody, um, you know, do training at the gym? Maybe you're training on weights or um, aerobic or anything like that. You know, you do need to be getting the heart rate up to be training, but you don't want to be pushing yourself too far for too long. And then, of course, if we get too far, so it looks like our performance is increasing, increasing, as we're doing more and more. But if we do too much, then it kind of falls off the cliff there. So if you are feeling really overloaded, really stressed out, um, there are kind of plenty of things we can do to help with that. Because even though you might feel if you're over there and really stressed and really, you can really crunch through all of your assignments and all that kind of stuff, I'd really encourage everybody, make sure you have a bit of time to kind of dial it back and relax because Otherwise, that's not going to be sustainable. Okay, in a degree, it's very much a marathon, not a sprint. The last slide I'll say about this, it's really more if, if you're kind of feeling over here, if you really are feeling kind of stressed, you know, it is um, quite usual this time in the semester when things are kind of building up. So I just have got one slide about some resources that are available, some things you might want to take a look at. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, that's the last point I want to make. This is the kind of optimum zone that you want to be in for training there. So if you are outside that, okay, maybe take a look at some of these uh, extra resources. So um, UEA is great because it is very supportive. Okay, there are lots of uh, ways to get support. If you are feeling a bit stressed, um, you might just find it's kind of tricky to 
uh, find some, you know, exactly uh, what's going to be the right thing for you. So if you are feeling kind of a bit too stressed, I'd say a good place to start is by asking your academic advisor. Now, they're not going to solve all your problems, but they will be able to point you in the right direction. OK, um, if you'd prefer, uh, please do feel free to ask me again. Certainly cannot solve everything, uh, but I can kind of point you to the places on campus that might be able to help. Uh, so there are lots of um, support kind of opportunities available on campus. So the Students' Union does some great support. There's the Wellbeing Service and there's also the Learning Enhancement Team, especially if you're kind of more stressed out about coursework. So there are lots of opportunities. If you're feeling you're kind of getting more towards that stressed outside, uh, please do make the most of them because they really are uh, very helpful. And just to flag up one thing, um, they actually have in the Wellbeing Service a Managing Stress Workshop uh, this Wednesday. Okay, So I thought, especially as we are thinking about stress, uh, you know, as a kind of physics concept and especially as you know, we can get a bit stressed at this time of semester anyway, I thought it might be a good idea to just flag this up. Okay, so that is next Wednesday, if that's something that you think might be uh, helpful. But that's all I wanted to say about stress as the kind of, uh, you know, the everyday sense. So for the rest of the lecture, when we're referring to stress, it's going to be um, in the physics sense. So we're going to be shortly finding out exactly what we mean by that and also the uh, related concept of strain. So if you guys remember um, last time on Monday, we were looking at pressure and we had this example of a very low pressure situation with this gravitational wave detector. Do you guys remember this, the gravitational wave detector in the States? So this is one of the biggest ultra high vacuums ever constructed. So each of these arms, just to recap, so we've got an arm going off here, it's four kilometers long. And then at right angles over here, we have the other arm also four kilometers long. And these tubes, they're kind of evacuated tubes, ultra high vacuum, and they're shining lasers down them to very precisely measure the length of these tubes. And the reason they're doing this is to detect gravitational waves. So the idea is your gravitational wave comes into the detector. And the, what the effect is, is that it very, very slightly distorts the length of the arms of the detector. And this distortion in length, that's what we call strain, the change in length, the fractional change in length. So I'm going to show you guys a bit more exactly about what we mean by that. But just to start with, this huge detector there, everything, all of the fantastic equipment there, it's all about measuring strain. So it's certainly a very important concept here. Now, before we get to the math, I'd just like to share with you guys one slide about um, what's going on here and how these gravitational waves affect the strain in these arms. So the idea is that out in the cosmos, hundreds of millions of light years away, there's some really um, exciting astrophysics stuff going on. You might have some neutron stars merging or you might have some black holes orbiting each other. And they've got a little uh, visualization of this might look like something like that. So this is a um, animation of two black holes orbiting each other. This is a kind of visualization, but this really is pretty close to what's happening. Whenever you have something very, very dense with a very strong gravitational field orbiting each other, it's sending out what they describe here quite accurately as ripples in the space-time pond. And what these ripples do is they cause strain on things. They cause very tiny changes in length as they travel through the universe. And that's what is being detected with that gravitational wave detector. So that's the kind of idea of what's going on out in space. And then back on Earth in that gravitational wave detector, those two arms, they're filled with laser beams, kind of look something a bit like this. So this is very much not to scale. And the idea is the gravitational waves coming across and it's very slightly changing the arms of the uh, interferometer. And that's what we're detecting as a signal. And that's essentially how you go about detecting gravitational waves. It's all to do with the strain in the arms of the interferometer. Obviously the effect here, it's hugely, hugely exaggerated. We're gonna be seeing in a bit exactly what the effect is. Now, in a couple of weeks when we're studying waves and optics, we're going to find out a bit more detail about what's actually going on 
Um, in a situation like this, in a piece of equipment, we call an interferometer, what's going on with the waves, how we can actually detect the signal. But for now, let's just think about it as, you know, we have some arm in our detector and it's being squashed and stretched. That's causing a strain. Uh, so let's think a little bit about the strain. Let's take a look at the math, see exactly what we mean by this. So the situation to think about, uh, whenever we're thinking about stress and strain, uh, we want to kind of imagine some piece of material. So this stick here, perfectly fine. We've got a piece of stick here. Um, kind of looks something like this in the form of a diagram. So we've got a stick, maybe a you know, column of something, could be a structure, and we're applying a force either side of the stick. So in this case, you know, we are compressing the stick. So if the stick has some original length and it has some change in length, that's actually how we define what we call the strain. So the strain is the relative change in length of something like this. So mathematically, we can write it down. We use a little epsilon, a Greek letter epsilon for the strain. So it's our change in length, that delta L, divided by whatever the original length was. And that can be a compression or it can be a stretch. Especially if you're in engineering, um, you're probably going to focus a lot more on exactly the difference um, in strain. If you're compressing something versus if you're stretching it out, it does have quite an important effect on materials. But for now, we're just thinking about any change, whether it's a stretching or a squashing. Now, with this situation, that change in length, it's due to the force which is being applied at either end uh, of the cylinder. And that force is how we go about defining the stress. So stress in physics is defined as internal pressure. So do you guys remember last time we looked at you know, normal pressure? So that's the force per area acting on something. And we usually think about pressure as some external thing. So you might think about atmospheric pressure, that's the pressure due to the, uh, the weight of the atmosphere pushing down on a surface. But stress in physics is internal pressure. And without wanting to labour the point, I do think there's a nice connection there between what we mean by stress in physics and also what we mean by stress in everyday language. You know, if we think about something that you might find a bit stressful, you know, we're going to have an exam at the end of this module. Now, everybody's going to take the same exam. Um, so in some sense, the, the pressure there is going to be the same. But how stressed out you feel about it is going to vary from person to person. So maybe some people, they don't find exams particularly stressful. It's not going to be a big deal. Other people, even if they work very hard at the course, you might still find the exam a bit stressful. So the idea that stress, it's a kind of internal concept. It's just something to bear in mind, okay, because that's true in the physics sense of stress and also in the everyday sense. So as an equation, it's actually defined in the same way as external pressure. So if we look, we've got some force acting on our cylinder and the cylinder has some area and we're thinking about the cross-sectional area. And then we define a stress really in the same way as we defined pressure. So we use a Greek letter sigma and it's force per area. Now, I'm sure it won't come as any surprise that we're going to be thinking about the units of these. So let's start with a quick question thinking about the units of strain. So I've got the equation for strain there. Let's have a think about what the units of the strain are going to be. So again, with these units questions, you don't need to guess. Just take a look at what goes into the equation. From that, with a bit of algebra, you can figure out what the units of the quantity have to be. If you're not sure, a few people here, they've done strain before, maybe run what you're thinking by them. Okay, let's see what everybody thinks for this one. What are the units of strain going to be in the, in the SI system? What do we get here? Okay, so actually that looks pretty similar to the distribution from the first question there, doesn't it? Um, so if we take a look at what's going into this. So our uh, strain... Ooh, ooh. I don't know if you guys heard that. Did, oh, God. I think I've lost my hearing in that ear. Okay. Um, so, our, um, where were we? 
Strain is equal to delta L over L. I don't even like this piece of chalk anymore. Um, so, um, so if we think about the units of, um, of our strain, so delta L, this is, it's a change in length, but it's still a length, so that's going to be meters. And then L is meters again. So we have meters divided by meters. So I can see why people might be going for maybe it's just, is it just going to give us regular meters or is that, you know, per meter squared or something? But remember, we don't have to guess. These are just kind of pieces of algebra like anything else. You know, if it was x over x, we know what that's going to be. If it's meters over meters, we know what that's going to be as well. So that's just going to be uh, one. It's just going to be one. It's not really going to have physical units. Now, I slightly kind of uh, disguised that in there in the question because I didn't want to give the whole game away. OK, so what is that uh, m to the power of one? What's the m to the power of one? What's that equal to? Meters, exactly. So m to the power of anything to the power of one, it's just equal to the own certain thing there. So meters. Um, and then anything to the power of zero, uh, that's just equal to one. That's just a property of exponents there. So the correct answer is option B there. So um, you can write it as m to the zero there, or in other words, it's just saying that the, it has units of one. So it doesn't have physical units because it's just a ratio. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. I made it a bit more interesting just because I thought if I put a one in there amongst all the meters, that would kind of stand out and you think, oh, there's got to be something suspicious about that. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. So that's actually how we define strain. It's the ratio of how much of something has changed versus how long the original length was. So we can actually try um, a specific example of this. So let's try with that gravitational wave detector, uh, LIGO, from a couple of slides ago. So those arms of the detector are four kilometers long. Each arm is four kilometers long. Now you might be wondering, why did they go to all the trouble of building such a huge uh, detector? Why build them you know, kilometers and kilometers long? And the reason is that gravitational waves have an absolutely tiny, tiny effect on the things they pass through. So the strain due to gravitational waves, it's about 10 to the minus 24. So unbelievably tiny. That's why the arms have to be so long. So let's see what we get. What is the change in length of these arms going to be for that strain and for the length of those arms? So we know what our strain is and we know what our original length is. So we're just solving for what delta L is. So just a bit of algebra for this one. OK, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What's our, our delta L going to be in this situation? What we get here? There we go. OK, so it looks like most people going for option C there. So we just need to do a bit of rearranging, rearrange this equation, solve for delta L. And then when we substitute in the numbers, we get our delta L. It's, you know, 4 times 10 to the minus 21 meters. So that's the correct answer. There. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. What does everybody reckon to that 4 times 10 to the 21 meters? Any surprises there? Any thoughts about that? So just for comparison, um, the size of a proton, it's about 10 to the minus 15 meters, that kind of ballpark there. So this distance there, it's orders of magnitude smaller than the diameter of a proton. So if you imagine those arms of the detector, you know, four kilometers long, imagine measuring something, a change in uh, distance to a tiny, tiny, tiny order of magnitude of the diameter of an atomic nucleus over such an extraordinary length. It really is an absolutely amazing experiment that they're able to detect such unbelievably tiny strains, even though you know, the, the math here is fairly simple to work out what it is. Uh, as an um, engineering feat to go about detecting it, it's just 
um, fantastically um, impressive. So well done, everybody, uh, with that one. So this is a very extreme example of uh, strain. Usually, you know, kind of more everyday situations, we're not going to be seeing uh, so much strain. So I've got an example here. We've got a, a slinky. Uh, now, one of the kind of best pieces of advice I ever heard about thinking about materials in physics is that, you know, some things, you know, they look nice and solid. We've got a nice table here and, you know, we've got all the kind of structure of the building and it all looks nice and solid. But really, at a kind of fundamental level, uh, the advice is that everything's really fundamentally made of slinkies. And some slinkies, they're kind of, uh, you know, stronger than others. You know, they're, they're not as obviously um, uh, stretchy. But fundamentally, when it gets down to it, uh, everything is as kind of elastic as a slinky there. So especially if you are engineers and you're trying to build a bridge, you might say, well, I just can just, you know, take a nice girder and I can just put it across something and that looks, you know, nice and solid. Really, everything is kind of stretchy and elastic. So if you imagine kind of making a bridge out of a slinky, you know, that wouldn't be such a good bridge for everybody. So even though some things, well, really everything kind of appears very solid, just remember that everything is kind of stretchy. Some things are just more stretchy than others. Um, so let's take a look at an example of how much something's going to stretch out. Uh, not quite as stretchy as a slinky, but I thought maybe let's take a look at a um, climbing rope. Does anybody here do any climbing? Any climbs? Oh, okay, a couple of climbs. You know, it's, it's funny. Physicists seem to, I, I, they, they do seem to kind of do a lot of climbing. I, I, I don't know what it is with that. Where, where, do, where do you go uh, climbing? I work in a climbing place. Oh, you work in a climbing place. Okay. I go to the climbing place. Oh, okay. Oh, brilliant. Oh, very cool. Um, so they do. Have you guys seen the university actually has quite a good um, climbing wall? Have you been on that? Do you approve of that? Or? Okay. Okay. Um, so if you're going uh, climbing, um, you want to know, you know, about the strength of the uh, rope you're attached there. So we've got some rope and we know the, the diameter of the rope and we know the mass of our climber. So let's think about how much stress is the rope going to be under if the climber is just suspended from it. So there's a couple of steps to this one because stress is force per area. So we need to work out what the force is and we need to work out what the area is. And just watch out with that diameter there because it's in millimetres. And also just be a bit careful because we might want to use the radius instead of the diameter. So just a couple of things to think about there. OK, let's take a look at the responses for this one. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. We get here. OK, so nobody's going for A. People going for B, C and D. Now, when you're working this out one out, did anybody work out what the force is and work out what the area is and then divide them? Who worked out that way? Good, great, absolutely fine way to work that out. But you surprised at how small the area was? You don't get much area, do you, from the rope? Uh, did anybody else kind of put the whole algebra together and just crunch all the numbers all in one go? Did anybody work it out that way? So I think with this one, it's actually quite a good idea to figure out, you know, the force and the area separately just helps to kind of check everything that's going on. So when you work out what the force is, you know, that's our mass times acceleration. That seems like a reasonable force. But because the area in meters squared comes out really, really tiny, what that means is that the stress that our rope is under, it's actually a very high amount of stress there. So that, you know, nearly six and a half megapascals there. So remember, mega, that's a million, so 10 to the power of six. So our climbing rope there, you know, we've got the person dangling off the end of it. It's under quite a lot of stress there. And especially if you're going climbing and you're relying on the rope, you know, to stop you from falling, you really want to know how much stress can you put your climbing rope under? Uh, did anybody ha have a slinky, like play around with a slinky when they were? Okay, now did anybody end up busting their slinky or, or get it tangled? Yeah, how did you, it just, it just got tangled or what happened? Oh, I just kept throwing it down the stairs wrong. Okay, throwing it down the stairs wrong, yeah. Did any, how else did, did it got all tangled and in a mess? I don't know how it happened, but it just happened. 
it just it just happens sometimes, right? So, yeah. So this one is still holding out. But of course, if we have a slinky and it's suspended a little bit, you know, it stretches out, bounces around a bit, but it just goes back. But if you take a slinky and you really pull it out, it kind of gets upset and you end up distorting it and it just ends up a big tangled mess and you could never really put it back to how it was okay now this is a very important property of materials especially if you're an engineer and you're going to be building something because if you're building something you know it's going to be subject to some strain it's going to have some stress you want whenever you're building to go back to how you built it you don't want you know your bridge or whatever to get permanently um, uh, out of shape now, the way that this is quantified is by looking at what we call stress-strain curves. So how much stress is the material under based on how much strain there is? So if I stretch the little slinky out a little bit, it's not under too much stress. But if I increase that, then the stress builds up in the slinky. But if I don't stretch it too much, then it just goes back to how it was. That's the idea with a stress-strain curve. So let's take a look at it over here. So on this axis, so this is strain, okay, how stretched out the slinky is. And I remember strain, it's just a, a ratio. So um, you, it does relate to how much it's stretched out, but we're just looking at the kind of, the, the how fractionally stretched out it is. And then over here, we've got stress. Now rem remember, stress is force per area. So if we're not thinking about changing the area of something, this axis is really telling us how much force we need to exert to get the strain. Now it looks something like this. For, for a large class of materials, uh, this, train, this um, curve tends to look something like this. So as we increase the strain, the stress goes up, and then when we get to a certain point and things get a bit more interesting. And if you keep stretching it out too much, we get some maximum, and then the um, stress starts going down again. And at some point, the thing is going to um, break apart. So certainly if you're going climbing, you want to know how much stress can your rope handle, how much can you um, stretch that rope out, and it's still going to save you before it's going to break. Now, if we look at the, the first part there, there's just a nice straight line relationship between the strain and the stress. Now, physicists we love straight line relationships. If it gets any more complicated, we tend to leave that to, you know, chemists and engineers and biologists. We like to kind of stick to the, the kind of simple things there. So this region here, where there's a straight line relationship between the stress and the strain, that's what we call the elastic region of the material. So over the elastic region. So what that means is if you stretch something out a little bit, it's going to go back to where it was. You're not going to change the shape of your material if you only stretch things in the elastic region. So if I have a plastic stick, you know, I can flex it a little bit. Can you guys see the, see the, the it does bend a little bit, right? But it just goes back to its shape once you stop flexing it. But if, you know, if you stretch it too much, uh, you're gonna break the plastic stick. So if we stretch something past the elastic region, and I guess this is kind of what happens to a slinky at some point. If you look, the stress often kind of dips down a bit there. And this is what we call the plastic region. Now, it doesn't mean plastic in the sense that your material, you know, has to be made out of uh, plastic. We mean plastic in the sense that it's going to be changed. So if you stretch something out and you get into this kind of region, it won't go back to its original shape. You will have introduced some permanent deformation. If you keep on stretching, if you keep on exerting the force, eventually you get into this region here. So it's called the ultimate tensile strength. So this is the maximum amount of strength that your material can withstand. It's not gonna go back to how it was, but it's still just hanging in there. So especially, you know, if you're climbing, if you're making something, you really want to know what this ultimate tensile strength is, okay? Because um, otherwise, uh, if you push things too fast, we get into this regime over here and we get to the breaking stress. So again, if you have a slinky, if you pull it a little bit, you're going to break it, it won't go back. If you really pull it, you could pull it apart, especially if it's one of those, you know, a plastic slinky, not a uh, metal one. You can quite easily uh, snap those apart. So if you start to get to this region where you're stretching something out 
and the stress is actually starting to decrease, don't be tempted into thinking, oh, okay, well, this is fine, I can keep on stretching. What it means is that your material is actually getting to breaking point. Now, I couldn't resist drawing some parallels between this stress strain curve and that kind of stress curve that we saw at the beginning of the lecture, because I think there are some kind of very sort of direct parallels there. And if it helps you to remember a little bit about a stress strain curve, then more the better. So if we're in this elastic region here, you can stretch something out, but it just goes back to where it was before. So in the kind of analogy here, you know, if you're at university and you know, you're not really feeling stressed at all, you're not really feeling stretched at all, um, you're not really gonna be changed by it. And at the end of the university, you're gonna come out the same as when you went in. So if you want to, you know, learn some stuff, learn some new stuff, you have to get into this plastic region. So in the kind of original graph, that's the kind of training zone. So if you want to learn something new, if you want to develop some new skills, you've got to get yourself under enough stress that you get into this region where you can make changes that won't just go back to where they were before. But of course, you want to watch out if you get to this ultimate tensile strength region, because you know that's really kind of as much stress as you can manage. You really don't want to go up there, certainly for too long, and you don't want to go beyond that. And then if you get really um, stressed out, you get to this kind of breaking stress. So um, you might think you kind of stretched out really far, but it's really all the material can take. And you know, like a slinky or something, if you keep on stretching it, that's as far as it's going to go. So for the last kind of couple of points for today, just kind of recap a few things about uh, stress and strain there. So we've got the, um, the equations there. So for what uh, strain is, so it's our relative change in length. And then we've got our stress there is our internal pressure. So these are generic properties that you can always write down for a material. But exactly how much strain you're going to get for a given stress depends on the material. So um, we've got over here um, a couple of different, uh, you know, wooden sticks over here. So if you've got the, the bendy wooden stick, you don't have to exert too much um, stress and the whole thing is quite bendy. But then if we've got the big chunky wooden stick, you can exert the same force and it really doesn't bend much. Okay, so it depends on what the material is made out of. And the relationship uh, between these, which depends on the material, it's what we call the Young's modulus. Has anybody heard of the Young's modulus before? Okay, okay, so maybe the same time as you did stress and pressure. So Young's modulus is the ratio of stress to strain. So we can just write it like this, the ratio of uh, stress to strain. And this is something which depends on the material. So something like, you know, a slinky, that's going to have a different Young's modulus to, you know, a solid bar of titanium or something like that. And it's how we characterize the materials. Now, in the next lecture, uh, what we're going to do is make some connections between what the Young's modulus of a material is to some of the other physical properties that we've seen previously. But for today, focusing on stress and strain, we're going to have lots of examples of these in the workshop. So get plenty of practice with this. There's also going to be an interesting challenge question this week, a bit different to some of the challenge questions we've seen before. So maybe think about giving this one a go, especially if you want to you know, stretch yourself out a bit more. Uh, but that's all for today about stress and strain. So very well done, everybody, uh, with the questions. I hope you have a good afternoon and I'll see you all tomorrow.